Amen. And everybody said? Amen. Man, it's good to see you guys this morning. Glad that you're here. Uh, we're in a, the very first week of a brand new series called Miracle Worker. And uh, sometimes in your life, you just need a miracle. I mean, sometimes you get to this place in your life where things are a dead end or they're not working out the way that you want or you've experienced loss or disappointment, lack of hope, and you just need something miraculous to happen in your life. You know, hope is one of those things that uh, we get confused as people. We need hope. We need that hope uh, that God offers in order to get through the really difficult times in our life. But hope is not... Uh, optimism you know optimism says it's going to be everything's going to work out i know that it's bad but it's going to be okay no problem and optimism is good but optimism is not hope and uh it's not wishful thinking uh hope is not uh just wishing and hoping that it's going to be okay it's not what is what is real hope hope is one of those things that in your worst day that you say man i know that this is bad i know that this stinks anyone ever have a day where you look around and you say, man, it just stinks today, right? Anyone? So just me and about five other people were, yeah. I think everybody that's probably breathing in this room has had one of those kind of days where you say, man, this is just, it's just not good. And you know, God is big enough for you to say that to him. You're, he's able to uh, handle it whenever you say, God, this, this is not good. It stinks. But hope is this. is in the middle of your very worst day, knowing that it's not good, knowing that God is in control. And because God is in control, your circumstance is not dependent on your own ability. And so we have hope in God. Now that's hope. That's something that you can depend on and that's something that can change your life. Wishful thinking and optimism will only go so far, but true hope in God is one of those things that will keep us going whenever we think that everything is going uh, to fall apart. Today we're going to look at three people and we're picking up just after the resurrection. So last week we ended at the resurrection on Easter Sunday and actually we were just getting started. So today we're starting at the resurrection. We're going to talk about three different people who were at the end of their rope. They thought that time had run out on their dream. They thought that they had lost all hope. They thought that they were the a, a complete and total failure and it wasn't going to work out for them. And I think that's when we need a miracle, right? We need a miracle whenever we don't have any hope. We need a miracle whenever we feel like we're a complete failure. If you've ever dropped the ball and you've done something that is so stupid, you think, man, I'll never get out of this. We need a miracle. We need the God to step in and do something that, that we can't do. Whenever we have a dream, a, a, a career or a goal or family or relationships that fall apart and we think that that dream is over, sometimes we need a miracle. And so we're going to look at three people today that needed a miracle just after the resurrection. We think of the resurrection from our perspective and we see that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. And man, we celebrate that and we know that we have hope because of that resurrection. But at the time, in the middle of that, in the middle of that resurrection time, there were people that were utterly confused and they were lost and they didn't know what to do. Three of them were, the, the three that we're talking about today was Mary Magdalene. Thomas and Peter. And so those three people, after the resurrection, went through a very difficult time, and they thought, I think, that their time had run out, that everything was over and they were done. But they really could have hope, and if they have hope because of this, the Bible says in the book of 1 Peter, through him, you, who, uh, through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. So that Bible verse right there tells us that our faith and hope uh, are in God. And I think the reason that so many people today have lost hope and don't know what to do is because they put their faith and their hope in the wrong thing. And I think maybe Mary and Thomas and Peter at all put their hope in the wrong things. They hadn't really put their hope in God Maybe they had put their hope in their own ability. Or maybe they had put their hope in a relationship. Maybe they had put their hope in their career. And they had had their hope in the wrong thing. And they were, they were confused. And they were doubting. And they were broken hearted. But the Bible says because of God, we can have hope. And whenever we feel like our hope is run out and we need a miracle, that's when God steps in. Yeah. And so I want to talk to you about these three different people. When do you need a miracle? 
Well, I think number one, you need a miracle whenever a dream is lost. And I don't know if you have ever experienced a lost dream, but we need a miracle when a dream is lost. I mean, maybe there was a time in your life where you had big plans. God put something in your heart and you planted the seed and you watered it and you thought it was going to work out the way that you wanted it to work out and it started to fall apart and that dream became lost. And I don't know what it was. It could be all kinds of things. It could be almost anything. Whatever dream God gave you that was not realized became a thing uh, that you lost. And whenever that happens, man, that robs you of your hope, that deflates you, that breaks your heart, and Mary was no different. <laughs> Mary Magdalene was someone that was looking for something. I don't think she knew what she was looking for. I think she was looking for God, but she didn't realize it. And she had put her hope in all of the wrong things. She had had relationships with men that she shouldn't have had relationships with, maybe to get that affirmation that she so much desired. And then there was a day that she met this guy that was different, and his name was Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus didn't condemn her, that he loved her, and he showed her a different way to live her life, that she could have faith in God because of what Jesus was going to do in her life. And she was radically changed. She was changed from the inside out and her life began a change from being a life of living for self and trying to satisfy that desire of acceptance and someone to fill that emotional need she had to a life of fulfillment and following Jesus and, and, and having purpose. And so here is Mary and Mary is following Christ and she has put her dreams and hung her dreams on what Jesus had promised. And she saw him as he went through that crazy trial that was a sham. And when everyone deserted him, Mary was there. Even at the cross, whenever the world was hurling insults and Roman soldiers were gambling for his clothing and people were making fun of him, there was Mary along with Jesus' mother. Would not leave. She was so committed and so dedicated to Christ. Because he had stepped in and changed her life and she had this dream of the way things could be. And then the Bible says that he drew his last breath and he died there on that cross. And I think when he died, Mary's dreams died because Mary had her hope in the wrong thing and she didn't understand who Jesus was. And I want to say to you, listen, if your dream is dead, it's never too late for Mary. If your dream is dead, it's never too late for that to be changed. And let me give you some scripture to back that up. The Bible says that Mary stood outside the tomb crying. This is Sunday morning, Easter morning, resurrection morning. She went to the tomb. She was brokenhearted. She was, she was there to mourn Jesus. She was standing outside of the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, and one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she said, They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And she was utterly distressed. Her hope was gone. The dream was gone. The dream was dead. The dream was in the tomb. And now she goes to mourn the dream. And, the, and he's, his body is gone. And she is so confused that she doesn't know what to do. And I wonder if in the loss of your dream that you ever feel that way. I wonder if whatever things just start falling apart, if your hope is gone and you don't know what to do. I mean, I have a dream and I know what God called me to do. And he planted this word in my heart. And I've been pursuing that, but it's all changed now. And there she was. Man, Mary needed a miracle. This lady needed a miracle. Because she knew that it was dead. Things were not working out the way that she thought they would work out. And the Bible says, at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her two things. And I think these, this, if you've lost a dream, this is what Jesus <clears throat> is going to ask you today. Jesus asked Mary these two things. He said, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And he said, who is it that you're looking for? See, if you've lost the dream and you think the dream is dead and you need a miracle, God is going to ask you these two things. Why are you crying? And who are you looking for? See, because I think in those two questions are the answer to our hope. Why are we crying? If Mary really understood that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he was going to be crucified, but that he would be resurrected. 
If she really understood the plan of God, if she really understood the words of Jesus, if she really understood who she was worshiping, she wouldn't be crying. She'd be rejoicing. And Jesus said to her, why are you crying, Mary? And he said, who are you looking for? Because obviously you don't know who you're looking for. Because if you knew that you were looking for the Messiah, you would understand that I'm standing right here in front of you and all of your dreams can be realized if you'll just claim it. Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. You know how wonderful it is when you call up your wife on the telephone? I mean, before you had to call her ID, she already knew who it was. <laughs> you get that one word, <clears throat> Hi, honey. You didn't have to guess who that was. You get that word, you hear that voice, and you know automatically that it's someone that you really love, someone that's dear to you, you know them. Mary didn't understand who Jesus was, and then Jesus said to Mary, Mary, he called out her name. He didn't say to her, Mary, oh, Mary, you missed the boat. He called out her name because he knew her, because he was alive. I want to say, maybe your dream has died. But Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows you intimately. Jesus knows your fears and your doubts. Jesus knows the thing that excites you and the things that disappoint you. Jesus knows when your heart is broken. And Jesus, standing outside of that tomb, said to this lady that had completely committed herself to him, Mary. He just called out her name. And immediately the Bible says she understood who it was. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, <coughs> Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I'm not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to the Father and your Father, uh, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And I think that as we look at the story of Mary and her lost dream and the hope that was gone, we need to remember this. There's no expiration date on Mary. And I want you to hear me on this. Mary thought that Jesus was dead. Mary thought the dream was over. Mary thought that this person that she had committed her life to, who really understood who she was, who had forgiven her, who changed her life, she thought that was gone. And Mary needed a miracle because her dream was dead. And I want to tell you that it is never too late because of the resurrection of Jesus, because of the power that he had over the grave, because he, he backed up everything that he claimed to be when he stepped out of the tomb, there's no dream that is dead. It is not too late for Jesus to work a miracle in your life. I want you to hear me. It's not too late for Jesus to work a miracle in your life. If death can't stop Jesus, nothing can stop Jesus. If you understand that it is God that you serve, Jesus who you've committed to, and your dream you feel like is dead, I would say look up because Jesus is standing there and he's crying out your name. He says, come to me and understand who I am and experience me and enjoy the freedom you have in me. Enjoy the power that I give. Live out the dream because the dream is in Christ. And if you're putting your hope in anything else than Jesus Christ and him crucified and resurrected, then you're going to be let down. And the minute that Mary understood that Jesus was still alive, what did she do? Man, she ran back and she told her friends. She went back and she said, the Lord is alive. She didn't say my friend is alive. She didn't say our teacher is alive. She said, the Lord is alive and the Lord is here to change things. And that would be my word to you. Is your dream gone? The Lord is alive. Is your dream gone? God knows your name. Is your dream gone? God understands that you're hurting. Is your dream gone? He knows that you're crying. Is your dream gone? Then understand that the Lord is alive and He's there to fulfill it. He wants to make it happen. He wants to make you put your trust in Him. So many times we put our trust in the wrong things. And so if Mary were here today, she'd say, listen, greatest thing ever happened to me 
I met Jesus. He changed my life. And he saved me. He gave me a home in eternity. And there was a time when I thought the dream was dead. But he stood in front of me and he said, Mary, he knew my name. And I cried out, Lord. And I, I was used by him to do great things. And I would say to you, if the dream's dead, do you think the dream's dead? Don't give up on it because God is still God. And nothing is over until God says it's over. Amen. Amen. Come on now. How are y'all doing? We're good. I said nothing is over until God says it's over. Amen. And it's not enough that I said nothing is over. God said it's not over until I said it's over. Yeah. And he said it whenever he stepped out of the tomb and he was resurrected. Yeah. Then there was another guy named Thomas. And man, we give Thomas such a hard time. But sometimes we need a miracle whenever our hope is gone. Whenever the dream dies and the hope is gone, I think about Thomas. And there was Thomas. Thomas had followed Jesus. Thomas saw the miracles. He knew what was going on. He knew about the dream. He had a word from God. God gave him a vision. He was part of the team. He was in the inside circle, the circle of trust. He was there. He was one of them. But Jesus died on that cross, and just like the other disciples, you know, every one of them, they ran away. They all ran. Thomas was no different. Thomas gets a hard, uh, we give him a hard time because he doubted. But I will tell you this, whenever we lose our hope, it causes us to doubt. And it puts us in confusion. And, I, and you should know that God is big enough to handle your doubts. See, sometimes we can't even admit our doubts to God because we think that God's going to condemn us. But God, God's not going to condemn you. Thomas was a perfect example of that. Thomas doubted. He didn't know what to do. Jesus appeared to the other disciples and Thomas was dragging his feet. And Jesus had already appeared to them. He showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And man, they were fired up. And so Thomas comes into the meeting and they say, guess what? The Lord is alive. And Thomas says, whatever. He said, I don't, I'm not going to believe it until I see myself. He said, I'm not going to believe it until I can see the handprint in his hand and in his side and I can touch it. Maybe then I'll do it. So I think Thomas was the first intellectual that we really had to deal with. He said, I need a little bit of proof. I need a little bit of proof. Because he was confused and he had doubts. And he didn't know what to do. And sometimes whenever we lose our hope, that's where we're at. We need a miracle. We need a miracle. And the Bible says that he turned, uh, that the Bible says this. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed. And now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples. He says, they told him we've seen the Lord. And he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand, put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, a week later, the disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, dummy. Then he said to Thomas, Really? Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hand, and reach out your hand and put it into my side. And the word that he gave to Thomas was stop doubting and believe. Yeah. See, I think whenever we lose our hope, we need a miracle. And I love it that Jesus appeared to Thomas. He went the extra mile and he said to Thomas, Put your hand here. And put your hand here. He didn't say to Thomas, I can't believe that your faith is so weak. Even though it was. He didn't say to Thomas, I can't believe that you didn't realize that it was me coming back and I would do what I said I would do. He simply said, put your hand here and put your hand here. And Thomas did and he believed and he cried out Lord. And I want to say to you, if, you've, if the dream is lost and if hope is gone, and you need a miracle, Jesus says to you, just see. Just see if I will not do what I said I would do. See, above any other person in history, Jesus stands up and makes the boldest claim that anyone can make, and then he backs it up with the resurrection. And he will say to you, I know that you're hurting and broken, and I know that your hope is gone, and I know that you doubt, and I know that you're confused, but if you just take the time, if you'll just research, 
if you'll just study, if you'll just seek me, if you'll just try. He says, I promise you won't be disappointed because I am the Messiah. And he said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. <clears throat> and if you lost hope, then I would say, get ready for a miracle because whenever we lose our hope, guess what those troubled times do? They prepare us for a miracle. Let me give you six phases of faith that will get you to a miracle. Number one is the word. You've got to have a word. You've got to have a dream. God will give you a dream. Anyone ever have a dream from God, a dream for relationship, dream for career, dream? Have you ever, God ever given you a word and said, this is what I'm going to do in your life? I hope you have. If you have, start praying for one. Because when you start praying for one and God gives you a word, I promise things in your life start to heat up. And so you've got to have a word. And then whenever you get that word from God, and maybe God is even speaking a word into your life now. Maybe there's a dream that he's planting in your heart right now, a seed that is starting to sprout. There is this point of decision. There's something that you will have to do, maybe even today. You will have to decide, do I believe that God is God? Word and decision. Will you say that God is God? Will you commit in your heart that God can do what he says? Will you commit in your heart that God can do the miraculous? Do you serve God? So God gives you a word. You make the decision. And then we think, man, all clear. Miracle's getting ready to take off. And that's not the way it works. See, because a lot of times whenever God gives you a word, there's also a delay. And that was what was happening here. Thomas had the word. He made the decision to follow Christ. But then he saw the challenge of the cross. And there was delay. And then there was difficulty. And there's no miracle, there's no dream that God gives you where you won't experience delay and difficulty. And all these things are working in you something. They're changing you. They're developing and strengthening your faith. Faith is like a muscle. It needs to be worked out. And that's what happens whenever we have a dream from God. He starts exercising that muscle of faith and it gets stronger. And whenever you go through those tough times and you see Jesus on the cross and you see him taken down and you see the blood and you see the reality that his body is not living any longer and they put him in the grave, man, hope. And God is working something. And we get to this place of the dead end. And we think that's it. And we need a miracle. Yeah. You ever been there? Yeah. Have you been to the dead end? Have you been to this place that you think is no good? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's one of the most exciting places you can be. Is at the dead end. Because you know what happens after dead end? Deliverance. After dead end, you get to experience deliverance. And deliverance that can't be explained. Deliverance that is something supernatural. Deliverance that has to be only the hand of God. Thomas was there. He was at the dead end. He was at his breaking point. He was ready to throw in the towel. He needed some proof. And Jesus stood up and said, Thomas, here I am. Touch my hand. Put your hand in my side. So I know that you doubt and I know that you have worry and I know that you're confused and I know that you have no hope and I know that you're at a dead end and you've tied a knot in the end of the rope and you're just hanging on. He said, I want to deliver you. Thomas looked at him and he touched the handprint and he was never the same. Jesus gave him that miracle of the resurrection and he said, stop doubting and believe. No hope, stop doubting and believe. When you started in that process of faith and strengthening your faith, and you got that word from God, and you made that decision that God, you're God. And I want you to rehearse that in your heart, God, you're God. I want you to say that in your heart right now. God, you're God, and I know that my hope is gone, but God, you're God. And my hope is not dependent on my ability, but my hope is wrapped up in the ability of the Almighty, the creator of the universe, the God that gave me the dream in the first place. God, you're God. And then step into deliverance because that's what he wants to do. Can you imagine the atmosphere in that room whenever Thomas touched the nail print? Man, that was probably some hallelujah moment. Don't you imagine? Revival was breaking out. And God was getting ready to launch the church, the birth of the church. And it was such an exciting time in their lives. And still there were people that needed a miracle. Peter. 
one of the people that was the closest to God, one of the, the, the one guy that stood up and said to Jesus the night before he was crucified, Lord, I don't care if everybody else on the planet leaves you, I'm going to be right there no matter what. No matter what. Because I'm just that kind of a stand-up guy. And Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter couldn't get his mind around that. Well, that would mean if I denied Jesus three times, that would mean I'd turn my back on Jesus. That means that I would be a traitor. That means I would be a deserter. That means that I would be so low. I mean, I'm sure that that night at the Lord's Supper, whenever they enjoyed that meal together, and Jesus revealed that news to Peter that he didn't believe it. And I, I would imagine that there have been times in our life where we've said, man, there is no way, you know, you hear about people that have done something, they messed up, really messed up, and you think, oh, man, I'd never do that. You ever do that? You haven't. Come on. You probably do it all the time. I mean, people mess up and was like, well, I'm glad I didn't do that, right? Or I could never do that, or I could never do that, or I wonder how they could get so far away from God, or I wonder how they could be so, you know, all kinds of things. And that was Peter, I'm sure, the night before, when Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. I think that was probably the craziest news that Peter ever heard. I mean, Peter was the same guy that got out of the boat and walked on the water to get to Jesus. That was Peter. I mean, a, a, a man of faith. But Peter failed. The Bible says that that night that Jesus was being taken to those trials and he was being beaten and he was falsely accused, that Peter, someone asked Peter, hey, weren't you with, uh, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter said, no, 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 you must have me mixed up with someone else. And then a little further on in the night, somebody said, hey, I think I saw you with uh, the people that were following Jesus. And Peter's like, mm, ah, well, I don't know. I mean, I look a whole lot like that guy over there, but I, yeah, not me. And then finally, someone said, yes, you, you were with the Christ. You were with him. The Bible said that Peter denied it with an oath. that he like cussed him out because they had said that he was with the Jesus people. In that instant, the rooster crowed. Peter heard it and remembered the words of Jesus. The Bible said that he left and he wept bitterly. And I don't know if you've ever failed so greatly that your heart was completely crushed and broken. And you thought there's no way. There's no way that God could ever love me. There's no way that God would ever use me. There's no way that I can be restored. It's just such a great failure. I don't know. So many things we put on ourselves, and the enemy uses guilt and all those things to make us think that we can't ever be used by God or we couldn't be forgiven. And I think maybe that's where Peter was. And after that happened, you know, Peter went back to his old way of life. He went and got the other disciples. He said, I'm going fishing. You guys want to go? And they went out and started fishing. But Jesus stepped in. Because Jesus wants us to understand that there's no failure that's so great that he can't restore us. And we need a miracle whenever we're defeated by failure. We need a miracle when we're defeated by failure. The Bible says that they were fishing and that Jesus was on the shore. And he made them breakfast. So amazing to me that God would look at us when we fail and when we don't get things right and mess up, totally go the wrong direction. That God doesn't look at us and say, Discard. They're no good. We'll set them to the side. Jesus went to where the, they were fishing. And he made them a meal. <clears throat> he had some coals and baked some fish. And they saw him. And they were filled with hope. And they all went to the shore. And Jesus was meeting with them. And can you imagine, though? Here's Peter. Peter that loved Jesus so much, so passionate about him. 
He was so passionate about the Christ that the night that they came to arrest him that he jumped out and with a knife he cut off the ear of one of the, the helpers of the priest and chopped his ear off because he was going to defend Jesus. And here he is and he had completely turned his back on the Christ the Messiah. Can you imagine what that must have been like for Peter? Maybe you can. Because maybe in your life you've had failure and shame. And you don't want to talk to God. You don't want to admit it to people. You want to bottle that up and keep it inside. Maybe it would just be your secret. But the great thing is this. God knows your secrets. He knew Peter was going to fail before Peter ever failed. And Jesus' grace and his love caused him to be on the bank of that lake and make those friends of his meal. And to say to them, I don't care how far you've gone, and I don't care how bad you feel, I love you. And I want to restore you. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, I'm glad I wasn't me at that meeting. Can you see it? Here's Peter that did the thing that was the, was the worst thing he could do. And he went and it would have been easier. I think it would be easier. I always felt like, you know, growing up it would be easier if my dad would just tell me, idiot. You know, that'd be easier. I, I, I didn't like getting whipped with a man. It was so much easier than the guilt, right? I mean, I got found out and the just, okay, you know. And I think for Peter, it's probably the same way, just that the guilt of carrying that and then seeing Jesus minister to him and love him. And then he addressed Peter. And he said, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I do. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. He said, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than this meal? Do you love me more than anything? He said, yes, yes. You know I do. And he said, then what I want you to do is feed my sheep. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. And finally, he says it. He says, you are omnipotent, you're omniscient. You know everything. You're all powerful. You know all of the things going on in my heart. You know all of the doubt. You know all of the pain. You know all of the guilt. You know all things. And I know that you know that I love you. And he said, if you do, then feed my sheep. And he said to Peter in saying that, that I love you so much that I'm bringing you back. And I want to use you to do something great for the kingdom. I want to fulfill your dreams. I want everything that you dream to come true. Sometimes we need a miracle. Sometimes we're without hope. Sometimes we're so broken. Sometimes there's so much doubt. Sometimes there's so much failure that the only way that it can be changed is that the Messiah steps in and says, I love you, I forgive you, I restore you. And he gives us that hope. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost when the church was born and he preached the gospel with such boldness that 5,000 men got saved that day. On that day, plus women and children, and they baptized them and they added them to the church and God used Peter, a failure by, in our, by our standards, just an uneducated fisherman to be used to launch the church. And I want you to remember this. If you don't take anything home with you today, if you don't take anything away from this, that Jesus 
specializes in new beginnings. That our Lord specializes in new beginnings. And maybe you need a miracle of a new beginning today. Well, whenever anyone puts their trust in Christ, they become a complete new person. They aren't the same anymore. The old way of living disappears, and they get a fresh start and a brand new life. So maybe the dream is dead, maybe hope is gone. Maybe you failed beyond the point of forgiveness, you think. I want you to know that Jesus works miracles. He is the miracle worker. And there is no failure in your life, and there is no doubt that it's too dead. And there is no dream that is too lost, that Jesus can't work a miracle. And restore. I guess my question to you today is do you need a miracle? Do you need a miracle? If you are, Jesus stands with his hands stretched out. He says, Stop doubting, believe. Believe.